Good evening. Hi, I'm Gretchen Rumor, and I want to welcome you to the 27th season of the Contemporary Writers Series, which this year will focus on working class voices in U.S. literature. As we begin this season, we acknowledge the generous funding of Dr. Tony Foster and acclaimed poet Linda Nemec Foster, which has made this series so spectacularly possible. I first met Matt De La Pena at the Assembly for Adolescent Literature, also known as Allen Conference. Matt spoke to an audience of 200 secondary teachers and teacher ed educators, sharing about his life as a writer, providing encouragement, and even giving us a sneak peek of what he'd been working on, a poem he'd written just a few days before about love. You can imagine my delight when a year or so later, that very poem was published as the most gorgeous picture book, which I shared with my children. I hadn't encountered a book quite like Love because it seemed to tell the truth about life to children. Not everything in the book was a happy representation of love. In fact, some of the book was dark. The one thing that remained, that sustained despite the darkness, was love. It is in such truth-telling that we honor the perspectives and experiences of readers, and I think that is one reason why Matt's work is so beloved. Matt's known as the kind of author who has written the book a young adult finally reads, the book that starts everything. Several of his books have been named Quick Picks for Reluctant Readers and Best Books by the American Library Association. Last Stop on Market Street, which tackles issues of race and class as seen through the eyes of a young boy, was awarded the Newbery Award, one of the few times a picture book was recognized in this way. Matt has also been awarded the National Council of Teachers of English Intellectual Freedom Award, a notable distinction in this unfortunate age of book banning. No matter what he is writing, whether it's picture books or biographies or fantasy or superhero lit, or speculative young adult fiction, Matt seeks to draw us in, represent life in authentic, interesting ways, and bring us along with him. Earlier today, Matt challenged his audience to represent important life moments with only two words. One student said puzzle pieces because of the many ways her life didn't fit together. Another student said dinner table because despite the many challenges her family has gone through, they always manage to gather there. Another student said disconnected speech, due to his experiences with speech therapy while living in a fully Spanish-speaking household. Finally, a student shared her, her two words, breaking walls, a reference to the many mental and physical struggles she'd overcome. It made me wonder, what two words could we use to describe our experiences this evening? this week, this season, and what two words might I use to describe a number one New York Times best-selling Newbery Medal winning author of seven adult novels, young adult novels, two middle grade novels, and seven picture books and counting. Okay, now, your Wikipedia page, I don't know if it's been updated recently, so you might have to tell us if you've written more than that. <laughs> well, for those two words, how about writing wholeness? Recently, Matt said that when he became a reader, he found a secret place to feel. Literature became a personal journey for him, one that nobody else needed to know about. It felt good to experience a range of emotion through books. It made him feel whole. Even today, as young writers were describing their lives in two words, they were finding those secret places to feel and to feel whole. Matt. Thank you for speaking truth and wholeness into this space. It's our joy and privilege to hear from you, learn from you, and celebrate you as part of the Contemporary Writers Series. Welcome. Hello, how are you guys doing? I feel so lucky to be here, so thanks for having me. And what I'm gonna do, share a little bit of my work with you, and I'm also going to read a couple things to you. But when I say I'm gonna share my work with you, part of that is how I see the world. And so we all have all these experiences that make up who we are. 
One of them for me happened when I was very young. I grew up in a border community in San Diego, a place called National City, and I had family on both sides. So we were on the America side, and my dad's parents were mostly on the Mexican side. But I was struggling in school a little bit. I was having a tough time. I was almost held back in second grade because I, I learned how to read very slowly uh, behind the rest of my peers. So my parents had this idea. They thought, what if we moved out of this district, which was a struggling district, and we moved north, and he could go to a school district that's doing a little bit better. We only moved about, I would say, maybe 12 minutes north. But you know, for a kid, that's huge, right? So it was a whole different environment. We also moved there in the summer, the beginning of the summer. So I had no one to hang out with. I have my two younger sisters, but I couldn't hang out with them. That would be crazy. So I was, I was all on my own. And I was, it was a very lonely summer. Well, my favorite uncle in the world, my Uncle Tim, he sort of recognized this, and he decided that he called ahead a couple days before and said, I'm going to take Matt to the beach. So he drives up Sunday morning, drives up in his Bronco. You guys know what a Bronco is, right? I know there's a new incarnation of the Bronco, but he had the old OJ-esque Bronco. So he drives up, and you know he's a big guy. 6'4", for a Mexican, that's a pretty big deal. Um, and he parks. Now, my mom was always a little worried about this uncle because admittedly, he was kind of in, in and out of jail a little bit, and he, he had some problems. So she was always cautious of him, but he was my favorite uncle because he was funny, and he just was always laughing. So I was so excited on this Sunday to go with my uncle to the beach. He comes rumbling up the stairs, and he goes, Matt, I got everything. I got a cooler of Cokes. I got towels. I got a football. Just grab your stuff and let's go. So I climb into the Bronco. We drive. Does anyone here know anything about San Diego? Some of you do. So we, so you know, we're a National City family, but he took me to Del Mar Beach. This is like a very fancy beach. He parks. It was a weekday. So it wasn't super, super crowded. Um, a lot of people were working. We get out of the Bronco. We go toward the beach with all the stuff. And he says to me, today's your day, Matt. We can, go any, we can go sit on the beach anywhere you want. And I was like, OK. I didn't really know how to swim. So I thought maybe by the lifeguard tower would be a good idea. So I said, what about over here? And he goes, you know, that's an OK spot. But actually, let's go sit over here. And we ended up sitting next to three college-age girls who were hanging out. And we sat very uncomfortably close to them. Um, by the way, my uncle, he was about their age. So it was, you know, made sense. But you could tell they were looking at us like, why are they sitting right next to us with all this open beach? So we started uh, throwing the football around. I'm catching it. My uncle's tackling me and shoving my face in the sand. And what I realized pretty quickly as he was using me a, as a prop to get their attention, which I respected. Um, we were throwing the football around for a while, and then he got bored, and he said, hey, Matt, let's go swim to that buoy out there. And remember, I'm not a good swimmer, but I wanted to hang out with my uncle, so I said, OK. So he runs up to the shore, dives in, and starts swimming. I run up to, the, to the, where the water is, hop in, and start dog paddling. After five minutes, I realized this was not very smart. <clears throat> so I said, hey, Uncle Tim. And he treaded water and looked around. And I said, I don't think I can make it. And he goes, come on, Matt. Don't be a baby. We could do this. We could do this. Let's go. So I didn't want to be a baby in front of my uncle, so I kept going. Ten minutes later, he was the one who turned around. And he looked at me, and he goes, shoot, Matt. I don't think I can make it either. And I was like, oh, my god. We were literally between the buoy and the shore. And I was like, I think I'm going to die. And I started to hyperventilate. I was putting my hand on his shoulder, and he was smacking it away because he only cared about his own safety at that point. <clears throat> and I was like, what are we going to do? <clears throat> and he said, we got to call for help. So he started yelling for the lifeguard like this, blow, you know, whistling through his fingers. The lifeguard, who was a woman, that's important to the story, she stands up. She first looks at us through binoculars, 
And at this point, people on the beach were starting to notice that we were in distress and they were pointing. People walking by were stopping and looking. And she puts down the binoculars and she picks up an electric megaphone and she says, no, just stand up. And it turns out we were on a sandbar. And so <laughs> basically my uncle, he just put his feet down and the, the water was up to here on him. He basically walked back to shore. It was a little over my head even when I put my feet down, but I worked out a system where I could jump, get a breath, go back down, jump. So I jumped back to uh, the shore. But I was a young guy, so I didn't think much of it. And I said, hey, Uncle Tim, you want to just throw the football around? And he goes, no, we got to get out of here right now. So we grab all the stuff, and we go to his Bronco. And he's definitely you know, a little flustered. And he gets in the car and kind of blindly pulls out quickly in reverse. And this is where the story takes a little bit of a turn, so I apologize, but some young kid, uh, you know, similar age, uh, young college, is coming down in a BMW, because it's Del Mar, and he has to slam on the brakes, and my uncle has to slam on the brakes in reverse, but you have to remember what just happened to us, and that, that tells you a lot about what, what happened with my uncle after this. They started cursing at each other, and my uncle actually, who's a construction worker, he pulled a sledgehammer out of the back of his Bronco. He did not touch the guy, but he bashed every one of his windows. And about five or six minutes later, I was in the back of a police car watching them push my uncle into the back of a second police car and drive him away. Why do I start by telling you this story? Because that is how so many young boys learn what it means to be a man. Every book I have ever written is me studying that boy who's watching that scenario and trying to figure out where he goes from there. It doesn't matter if I'm writing a picture book or a novel. That's where I'm coming from. Actually, that scene is in um, one of my books, We Were Here that exact scene, because I like to steal from real life and put it in books. Um, but I wanted to kind of move from there to this, because this is also from my own experience. This is from the picture book you heard about in the introduction, Love. And what a lot of kids know that adults sometimes forget about is that when you read a picture book, you of course read the words, but what else do you read? The images, right? So if you were going to read this picture, what's something that you, you might notice here? Can, can somebody volunteer to tell me something you're observing and just yell it out loud? Yeah, that's a great start. So we see a family together, right? By the way, if we want to take that even further, it's a multi-generational family, right? Tell me something else. Ooh, who said faith? Do you see the faith there? We see a picture of Jesus. We see a cross. So that is significant to this family, right? What's something else? I heard somebody else yell something out. Light. Yeah, so there's light coming off this. If we were going to ignore the words and guess, you know, who knows how long it would take us to get here. But that, that's a TV, right? You can tell by the text. What else do we see? Okay, so that's the whole point of this image. So we'll, we'll stop there. So you see this little girl is separated from her family. Why is she separated? Because do you see the grandmother? She's holding up her pothole-covered hand and saying, no, Miha, don't come any closer. This isn't for you. So that kind of tells us, without even reading the words, that something scary happened on the news, right? and she is not old enough to see it. One of the reasons I like to start with this image is because this is something we forget, is that, especially during the pandemic, but, but even now, while we are watching the news, listening to the news, reading the news, our youngest family members are watching us to determine how worried they should be. I know because during the pandemic, I had a, what, a six-year-old, and a two-year-old, two or three-year-old, yeah, two-year-old. So my kids were 
so young and they couldn't take in the news the way you know adults did but they understood just by watching us um, how worried they should be and then one other thing I wanted to share the illustrator whose name is Lauren Long he texted me because he knew I wanted this to be a Mexican-American family because this was the first idea that sparked the whole book this scene and he said Matt Tell me a couple things that were in your grandmother's house because I want to make it uh, authentic. And I was like, oh, that's easy. So I texted him back in about a minute and I said, well, my grandmother, when we all get together, she's always making tortillas. And she makes incredible tortillas. We later found out she put lard in them. That's why they were so good. But we, you know. So she's always making tortillas. So obviously, she has a pot holder there. I said, my, mom, my grandmother only allows Frida Kahlo posters on her walls. So you can see Frida over there, right? My grandmother was part of a very unfortunate generation where they really loved the doily. So there's a doily on every open surface in her house. So you can see that's represented over here. My grandmother also is very Catholic. So I was like, you know, she definitely has a cross on the wall, but just in case that's not clear enough, she probably has Jesus there too. So you see that too. Um, and yeah, so that's sort of inspired by my family. I always tell people, a good writer doesn't go into a book with a message, but you should go in with a point of view. And I've already kind of told you a lot about where my point of view comes from. So here's my grandmother when she was young with my grandfather. This picture is taken in, in Tijuana, Mexico, and this was before they came to America. They had a dream. They thought, what if we crossed over? Maybe our son, and this is very similar to my, the story I told about my parents, maybe our first son, they only had a, my dad and one of their children, and one other child. At this time, they ended up having five maybe he could be educated in America. So they crossed over, and I'm so thankful that they did. They were undocumented. They found a community to be in, which was really close to the border. So they only made it five miles in. Um, they found work, and they raised their family. And the reason I say that I'm so thankful that they made that journey is because now I get to stand in front of you today as an American author, and that's something I'm so proud of, and I never could have done that if they didn't take that risk. <coughs> so there's my grandparents. Here is their first son. That's my dad there, and I'm that little chubby kid right there. I think there was a, an undiagnosed medical condition. Um, <laughs> but actually, this picture is taken in my grandparents' basement because that's where we lived for the first five years of my life. And when I was young, I used to think that was a, a bummer, you know, other kids have their own house or whatever. But looking back, I feel so lucky because we, we had so many people who cared about us living under the same roof. Two-bedroom house, we had my grandparents, me, my mom, my dad, and my middle sister. She was born there too. But also my auntie and her daughter, my cousin, so we had a full house, but we all kind of looked out for each other. And I also want to mention my dad here. So he was first gen. He worked really hard, but school wasn't really his thing either. In fact, he had children before he was 18, so he had to drop out of high school to get a job to provide for them. Um, but He's probably the hardest working person I know. So he always had at least one job, but most of the time he had two jobs. So my dad, his background, Mexican. But I'm a mixed race kid, so my mom is Caucasian. And this is, I'm about to show you a picture of me and my mom, but I have to warn you, this isn't the best picture I've ever taken, okay? Um, but here's me and my mom. <laughs> Please note the doily. That was in my grandma's house, too. Um, my mom was even younger than my dad, and my, my um, mom, actually, when she accepted her diploma, she was actually carrying me for high school. So hardworking people, 
But she was very smart. She actually got a 3.8 GPA in high school. So she had all this talent. But unfortunately, she couldn't go on to college either because she had two kids already and ended up having three. Um, but so that's this is part of my point of view too, is growing up like this. I'm sure many of us have backgrounds like this, and this is what I like to draw on. So when I got into high school, I fell in love with basketball. But my dad made a rule for me. He said, if you live under my roof, you have to work. So I got a job at Domino's Pizza, and I worked there for three years. My life in high school was so simple. I would go to school every day. My mom never let us miss a day of school, and she made one rule for me. She said, I know you love to play basketball, and you play all the time. As long as you get a 3.0, I will not question how much basketball you're playing. So what do you think I got? I got a 3.0. And if I was ever starting to flirt with a 3.1, I would like miss a test on purpose. No, I'm, I wouldn't go that far. But I just did the bare minimum. I worked my job, and I played basketball. And what I started to realize as I got pretty good at basketball was that there was a chance that I could get a basketball scholarship. So not only was basketball something I enjoyed doing, I also understood the game as something that could take me out of our circumstances and let me see something new. So I played so much basketball. I gave everything I had to the sport. Um, but even though I was not focused on school, sometimes things would break through. Like uh, this was the first time I ever read a book that I sort of fell in love with. Um, it happened in middle school. It's called The House on Mango Street by Sandra Cisneros. This book um, is about a character growing up in Chicago. And even though I was growing up in San Diego, it was the most uh, personal I ever felt a connection to a book. And so I, I read this book over and over in middle school. I probably read it 12 times before I got to high school. Sometimes the teacher would say, Matt, you should try another book. And I'd be like, why? This one's great. And I would just read it again. <laughs> well, I was fortunate enough to get a basketball scholarship. And this was something I got to do that was brand new for our family. I got to go to college. And if, if anyone is a big sports person, I went to the University of Pacific, which is in the same conference as Gonzaga, uh, the West Coast Conference. So kind of a lot of smaller Division I schools. Um, and it was, to this day, the greatest accomplishment of my life was getting to go to college. Because my entire world opened up there. Um, I remember sitting in classrooms and having my mind just expanded by the second by these incredible professors. And I couldn't believe that I was lucky enough to get to do this. But what a lot of people don't realize is that when you are the first in your family to go to college, there's another side too. And that other side is that you feel guilty. You feel like almost guilty for succeeding. And I felt like, you know, real life is happening back in San Diego and here I am in Northern California just having the time of my life and I felt guilty. I think honestly, if I didn't have the basketball program and the support system we had, I would have dropped out and I'm not sure you're, you're aware of this, but Hispanic students have the highest dropout rate in the country, and I think it's from that, you know? But I was lucky, I kept, I kept at it, and I, I started to feel more and more comfortable, and then something happened. So early in my freshman year, I realized that I was not good enough to play professional basketball. Does anyone know the name Steve Nash? So he's retired. He just got fired from the Brooklyn Nets last year, I think. Uh, well, I played against him in college, and I have to tell you, he destroyed me. And after the game, I remember thinking, wow, he scored 35 points and I scored three. Maybe I'm not going to the NBA. And so I had to start thinking, well, what do I want to do for a living? Well, what nobody knew about me back then is that all through high school, I would secretly write spoken word poetry and share it with no one. Usually, it's, it was my way of processing things that I didn't quite understand. Like, what does it mean to be mixed race? What does that mean to me? Nobody talked about it back then. What does it mean 
to live so close to the border and that we were considered poor on the American side of the border, but then every Sunday we'd go have lunch with my grandfather and we'd walk into his neighborhood and the kids would be like, here comes the rich kids. So why was I considered rich on one, or poor on one side and rich on the other? That was confusing and I would write about it. But it wasn't until I became a reader that I think literature became something I wanted to be involved with uh, you know, as, as a, an adult. So I, my favorite professor in undergrad, she taught African-American female authors, and she came up to me and handed me a book. This was probably my sophomore year. And she said, Matt, I was rereading this book last night, and I thought of you. I'd never had a teacher or a librarian or a professor connect me with one specific book before, and I was curious. So she, took, she handed me the book, and she goes, look, you're not in my class this semester. You don't have to take a test on this or do an essay. Just promise me before you graduate, you'll read this. And when you're done, come talk to me. And as a young guy, I thought, oh my god, that gives me three years. I could do that. So I took the book. I ended up reading the book um, on a road trip to New Mexico for basketball. And I'll never forget reading the very first 25 pages the first night. I, st I, I cracked the spine. And I remember thinking, why did this professor give me this book? First of all, it wasn't any good. Second of all, the narrator couldn't even speak that good of English. And I was like, don't you have to speak good English to write a book? Normally, this is when I would toss it aside and say I just couldn't connect. But I needed to find out why this professor connected me to this particular book, which was probably you know what she was doing, right? She knew what she was doing. I think I kept reading that night, and by around page 50, I started to care about the main character, who was very different from me. First of all, she was older, different gender, but I really wanted her to be okay because she had such a tough life. That's why I think reading, by the way, is the ultimate form of empathy, because you care about these characters who can do nothing for you, at least directly. <clears throat> so I read about a third of the book that night, put it down, went to sleep. The next day we had a basketball game, but if you know college sports, it's more than that, right? You have morning meetings, your, your meals, your shoot around, the game. I didn't get back till around 9.30 at night on the bus. And I remember for the first time ever, I had this feeling of like, I want to go find out what happens to that character. So I hustled up to my hotel room, shut the door uh, of the bathroom, because we always had a roommate, and I read sitting on the edge of the bathtub until 3 in the morning when I finished this book. And the, the wildest part was when I got to the end and turned the last page, I found myself on the verge of tears from a book. And I couldn't believe a book could do that to you. And before I, I reveal the title of the book, I do want the, I want the guys in here to know I didn't actually cry that day. <laughs> I toughed it out. Like, I don't know if you guys know this, but it's not an official cry unless the tear exits the eye. And what I did is I just looked up and it soaked back in and it was all good. <laughs> but do you guys know this book? It's called The Color Purple. This book made me want to tell stories because I just was blown away that a book could move somebody like that. A story could move somebody's heart. And as you heard in the introduction, I think growing up, you know, being that boy who watched my uncle get taken away, what that does is it creates this sort of void in your chest. And you think, well, I need to create this kind of like veneer of toughness and nothing can touch me emotionally but when I read this book it like filled that hole and it, w it felt really good so I went in search of other books that could do the same thing for me and like you heard in the introduction nobody else needed to know about it not my dad not my uncles it was just between me and whatever book I was reading so I read as much as I could uh, the rest of my college career fell in love with with reading but also telling stories of my own and I ended up going to graduate school at San Diego State. And um, I chose this school because my dad had lost his job when I was in college. And he, he worked at the San Diego Zoo. I don't know if you know, the zoo is a big deal in San Diego. It's like a big employer. And he had worked his way up for 20 years, going from sanitation <clears throat> to assistant uh, electrician to somebody. And then he worked at this part of the zoo called the Tiger River Trail, where 
it kind of was like a zoo within the zoo where he did all the jobs. He would feed the animals sometimes, and then sometimes he'd give like a private tour to somebody. I remember one time when I was a freshman in college, he called me and he said, hey, Matt, <clears throat> I gave a tour to Paul Simon today. And I was like, who's that? And he was like, it's this singer. And he told me two things about Paul Simon. He goes, man, that guy's short. And I was like, oh, yeah, okay. And then he goes, but also, we shook hands at the end. He goes, Matt, that guy had the softest hand I've ever felt. And I was like, huh. <laughs> but uh, what happened is a new regime took over at the zoo, and they implemented a new rule. This was during my junior year. They said, from now on, if you work in within a certain proximity of animals, you now have to have an animal science master's degree. And as you probably remember, my dad didn't finish high school. So he lost his job. And the problem with my dad is he's the brother of my Uncle Tim, and he also doesn't know how to process you know, weakness or vulnerability. So he just sunk into himself for two straight years, just complete depression, didn't interact with anyone in the family. So I chose San Diego State to support my family. Not my dad, because he was unreachable, but my mom and my youngest sister, who was still there. And we started this um, ritual. Every Sunday, I would go up there, because they lived about 30 minutes away from the school, <clears throat> and I would have lunch with my mom and my sister. My dad would be there, but he'd be in front of the TV, and he'd be eating on his own. Well, one of these Sundays, something happened, which was surprising. He came up to me before I left, and he goes, hey, what book is that? And I had, I had a book on the table that I had just read on the train ride up to their house. And I was like, oh, this is 100 Years of Solitude by this guy named Marquez. I just finished it. It's incredible. And then he looked at me, and he goes, you think I could read that book? And at the time, I remember thinking, I've never seen my dad read anything, not even the newspaper. I should really start this guy out with some Dr. Seuss. You can't just jump into Marquez. But you can't tell your dad that. So I said, sure. And I gave him the book. And he took it with him. I went back to the school. But I remember being very excited to see what my dad thought about one of the books I had read. So the next Sunday, I came up and I said, did you check out the book? And he said, no, I didn't have time. And I remember at the time thinking, he has nothing but time, but we won't get into that. The following Sunday, I asked. He said he didn't get around to it. So by the third time that that happened, I just gave up on my dad, considered it stolen property, and moved on with my life. Well, about four months later, on one of those Sundays, he plopped the book in front of me, and he said, I finished the book. And I was like, wow. And what I realized is slowly but surely, he was reading this very challenging text. And I said, well, what did you think? And he said, it was good. And you know, I'm in grad school at this point. I'm ready for a deep breakdown. So I asked him more questions. I said, well, what did you think about the magical realism? What did you think about all the Buendios family? And he looked at me and he goes, no, seriously, it's good. And I was like, okay, that's all I'm going to get out of him. As I was leaving that day, though, he followed me to the door, and he waited till my mom and sister were out of earshot, and he said, in a quiet voice, he said, hey, I was thinking, maybe I could read all of the, re the books you read in your program. And I was like, sure. So from that point forward, I gave him every book I read in graduate school, and he read every single one of them. And at the end, he would tell me if it was good or if it was bad. <laughs> and then he started going to the local public librarian and asking them what he should read. And then eventually, I sold my very first book. Um, whoops, I'm, some of the books. I sold my very first book, Ball Don't Lie, and moved to New York City. Well, at that time, my parents moved to Northern California because my dad associated San Diego with the zoo and he wanted a fresh start. Well, I was there probably only about two weeks when my mom called me and my mom never calls me. She thinks she's bothering me. And she called me and she said, I don't know what's going on with your dad, Matt. He hasn't been coming home until really late, even on weekdays. He, she said, I think he's having an affair. And I was like, Mom, you got to understand, to have an affair, you have to speak to other human beings. He doesn't do that. She's like, I don't know. Well, what we later found out is that he had secretly enrolled in the local community college to get his GED. 
And he didn't tell anybody because he didn't want anyone to know, what if he failed on the heels of failure? But he didn't fail. He got his GED, um, and then he told everyone he knows, which is basically me and my two sisters. But he wasn't satisfied with that, and he ended up transferring to get his AA degree at the local community college. And then he wasn't satisfied with that, and he transferred to UC Santa Cruz, where he got his BA in literature. And he ended up becoming a third grade teacher in a migrant community in Watsonville, California, where we get our strawberries and artichokes. And he taught in Spanish for, I guess, the last eight years of his working life. He just recently retired. And now he's the biggest lit snob I know, and he thinks he's smarter than everyone, but he's, an, he's a better father, he's a better community member, he's a better husband. And I think, you know, I started out by talking about my literary journey, but he has a special literary journey too, and I'm so thankful that I got to play a small part in that. Um, I know my time's coming to an end soon, but I wanted to just rifle through some of the books I've written. This is Mexican White Boy. It's about growing up mixed race, and it's probably the most personal book I've written. I wrote a book called We Were Here. That's where the swim story is in this book. Um, I Will Save You. And, you know, around this time, I'd written four novels. They were kind of quiet. They all took place in communities my, like mine. And one time I had this opportunity at a, at a a conference for teachers to speak to a pretty big group with other authors. And as I was leaving the stage, a teacher came up to me and said, hey, Matt, I wanted you to know I really like your books. She goes, I'll be honest, we don't really have those kind of kids at our school, so we don't have that many copies of your books. But I wanted you to know I appreciate your work. And I was like, oh, thank you, ma'am. I appreciate that. But something about what she said was bothering me in the back of my head, and I said, out of curiosity, how many wizards do you have at your school? And she was like, what? And I was like, never mind. But you guys know what I'm saying, right? Well, that leads me to just the last thing before I read a final thing to you. I wanted to just share with you, you know, a study was done about who are the main characters in the books young people read. And you can see back in, what is this, 2015, my category would be over here 2.4, which doesn't fully represent the number of people in this country that would fit in that category. And there was a lot of talk about this. And in 2018, they did the study again. <clears throat> and my little category did grow, but not by that much. It went to five. And do you see who gained the most? Animals and trucks went from 12 <laughs> to 27. Um, but that also is part of my point of view, and that it's why that I'm always going to try to tell these kinds of stories um, in The Living and The Hunted and Superman, and then the picture books I do, like I got to work with Pixar and a Coco picture book, uh, Carmela Full of Wishes, Last Stop on Market Street, and then I, I work with a lot of amazing illustrators, and one of them is Christian Robinson. Um, and I've worked with him the most. <clears throat> I also have two kids. They are my test subjects for my books. Uh, this is the first time I ever read one of my picture books to my daughter, Luna. She was very young here. Um, it didn't go so well. She cried through most of the book. I was very disappointed. She's older now, though, and she's beginning to read on her own. She's nine now. Um, I also have a little boy. He has very big cheeks. Do not be alarmed. Um, He's a little older now, too. He's, he's start, started kindergarten this year. Um, so all my friends that were writing books for young people that I didn't think they were that big of a deal, now that I have children, I think these people are amazing, and I love them. Um, I did a book called Milo Imagines the World. I know banned books is, week is coming up, and some of my books have been banned, and this is the most recent one to get banned again and again. I did a book called Patchwork. But I wanted to close by reading Love to You, especially because it was in the introduction. So, because my time is short, I'm going to fast forward through the art, and I'm just going to let you see how one particular image was done by the, the amazing illustrator named Lauren Long that worked on this book with me. 
So first it was just a poem. I read it at, at Allen. It was the first time I ever read it in public. And it just looks like this, just like a poem on the page, just like I used to write in high school. And then it gets in the hands of an illustrator, and he says, well, what am I going to do with this text? It says, and in time you learn to recognize a love overlooked, a love that wakes at dawn and rides to work on the bus, a pair of old house slippers that fit like love. So he does sketches, and this is him trying to figure out what he's going to do visually next to the text. The best illustrators, by the way, they don't just represent the text. They tell a second story alongside and in between the text. So his first version was this. But he felt like the boy looked like he'd been abandoned. So he tried again. He changed the underwear strategy. <laughs> and also, you could see he's changed the setting. He went from a kind of a more working class setting, because we wanted to vary the, the families that these kids came from, to a more luxurious apartment. But something still wasn't right. And I'm going to fast forward up to his 10th try, which is the one he sort of ended up choosing. And you could see what he's changed here. He brought in a little, or a big brother. I was so moved by this. For the first time in my career, I've crossed out one of the lines in the poem and changed it to represent the image. So I took out the bit about the house slippers and changed it to a slice of burned toast that tastes like love. And real quick, I'll just show you. He did uh, an art style called printmaking, where you render the sketch on glass, special paint. It's the opposite, because it's going to be an impression. He talked his wife into thinking he needed to buy a printmaker for this. <laughs> By the way, he's working on our second book together right now, and he's probably at the printmaker. Special sh sheet of paper goes on this that's slightly damp. He runs it through, and out comes the image. Just pulls the paint right off. But now he has to do the background. He liked the lighter one, but he liked the darker window, so he's now doing collage. And this is the basic composition that you see in the book, except for now he has to take out colored pencils and paintbrushes to fill in the details. And this is what's in the book, except for at this point, he found out I changed the words, and he had to burn the toast. <laughs> By the way, he thinks that's the best line in the book. I think it's a little self-serving, but he does think it's the best. So here's the process of burning the toast. Not burned, burned. <laughs> Not burned, burned. I know it's a small detail, but we love these things. And I'll just close by reading the book to you. Love. In the beginning, there is light, and two wide-eyed faces, two wide-eyed figures standing near the foot of your bed, and the sound of their voices is love. A cab driver plays love softly on his radio while you bounce in back with the bumps of the city, and everything smells new, and it smells like life. Love, too, is the smell of crashing waves and a train whistling blindly in the distance. And each night, the sky above your trailer turns the color of love. In a crowded concrete park, you toddle towards summer sprinklers while older kids skip rope and run up the slide. And soon, you are running among them and the echo of your laughter is love. On the, on the night the fire alarm blares, you're pulled from sleep and whisked into the street where a quiet old lady is pointing to the sky. Stars shine long after they flamed out, she tells you, and the shine they shine with is love. But it's not only stars that flame out, you discover. It's summers, too, and friendships, and people.
One day you find your family nervously huddled around the TV, but when you ask what happened, they answer with silence and shift between you and the screen. In your dream that night, you are searching for a love that seems lost. You open and close drawers, lift cushions, empty old toy banks, but there's nothing. You wake with a start in the arms of a loved one who bends to your ear and whispers, it's okay, it's okay, it's love. And in time, you learn to recognize a love overlooked, a love that wakes at dawn and rides to work on the bus, a slice of burned toast that tastes like love. And it's love in each deep crease of your grandfather's face as he lowers himself onto an overturned bucket to fish. And it's love in the rustling leaves of gnarled trees lined behind the flower fields. And it's love in the made up stories your uncles tell in the backyard between wild horseshoe throws. And the man in rags outside the subway station plays love notes that lift into the sky like tiny beacons of light. And the face staring back in the bathroom mirror, this too is love. So when the time comes for you to set off on your own, Heavy winds will sweep past your building and great gray clouds will congregate above. Your loved ones will stand there like puddles beneath their umbrellas, holding you tight and kissing you and wishing you luck. But it won't be luck you'll leave with because you'll have love. You'll have love, love, love. So thank you very much for letting me read to you. And I think we have questions if anyone has a question. So if anyone has a hard-hitting question, I'm happy to answer them. Um, There was an audible gasp uh, behind me and within myself. Why would your book be banned? Ooh, yeah. (laughs) You know what? I actually have part of that book here. Um, I'll show you the picture, because it's not the text. So this is, a, this is a book about a boy imagining the lives of the people on the subway around him, and he's going to visit an incarcerated parent. So, you know, there's a lot on his mind, and he, there's a, the psychology of what he's imagining. It part, partly is about his life, right? Well, one of the things that he imagines is this wedding dress woman, who you see over here, Um, She gets off the train, and he imagines where she's going, and he imagines this grand cathedral ceremony. They're going to go in a hot air balloon and lift into the sky. So this is what he imagines. But the book is called Milo Imagines the World, but it's really about him reimagining the world because there's this boy that you saw on the previous page, this guy right here, who he thinks lives in a very fancy place, like a castle like this. But it turns out that boy ends up getting off at the same stop, ending up in the same line to go visit an incarcerated parent too. So he's thinking, gosh, maybe you can't know anyone just by looking at their face. And so then the next page, he re-envisions the pictures he made. And do you see what the change is on the, the one with the wedding dressed woman? So maybe he had it all wrong, who she was going off to marry. And that picture has made this book, just the the image, um, banned in a few places. Any other questions? It's kind of of a sad story, huh? (laughs) Yes? So 
So that's a great question. So working with different illustrators, am I allowed at a writing uh, event to do a sports metaphor? <laughs> okay, let me try this. So like a coach who comes up with plays, you've got to then figure out which of your players is the best player to execute that play. And for me, when I come up with a book, I try to figure out who would be the best person to execute the story um, and add to the story. And you know, of course, these illustrators are very busy, so you hope that they're, they have time to do it. But after I get the illustrator pairing, I work with each illustrator so differently, and my job is to never get in their way, but to be a resource. So different illustrators are different. So the illustrator, Lauren Long, he would text me through the whole book. Like, he asked questions here and there. We, we one time at one of the Allen conferences, uh, NCT actually, but we had a lunch where we were gonna talk about what he was doing, and we just had like an hour for, for this. We stayed together for five hours in the restaurant because he wanted to talk about every single word of the story. So he likes to have a conversation. Christian, he likes to disappear into the basement by himself and have no communications except for an occasional text. He actually, um, there, one of the lines early on is, it's right here. Um, so it's talking about their faces, and, and the line is, the wedding dress woman near the far door had a face made out of light. A and uh, he texted me and he said, what does that line mean? And I said, oh, she's so excited about her wedding day that she's just beaming. And, he's, and, he, and by the way, I wrote that in like probably like 5,000 word text. It was very long and all my thinking behind it. And he just wrote back, thanks, I want to make her black. <laughs> so <laughs> he's, you know, Christian, the illustrator, he's black, and he just wanted to kind of like celebrate, you know, a black marriage. So he, he will always just give me little questions, but then he just takes it where he wants to take it. So to answer your question, everyone's different, and my job is to allow the illustrator to lead how much we communicate because they're doing half the work. And the people I work with, they're geniuses, so I want them to be able to have the freedom to do whatever they want. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for that question. Um, I believe good picture books are poems. Um, there's a picture book I love right now. Um, it's called Watercress. And I'm blanking on the author's name. I know some of you are very savvy with phones. Maybe you could quickly tell it, because I would like to highlight the author's name. But this, this book, Watercress, is such a beautiful poem. And an illustrator came along and made it this incredible picture book. So um, I do think good picture books can, are just poems. But also as a prose writer, um, you get little little moments here and there to be a poet, you know? Um, I always say in my books, I want to get the story right, and then I want to get the music right. And the music part is where poetry comes in. Uh, for me, if it doesn't sound right, then I can't move past it. So I have to get the sounds of the sentences right, even in a book that's 60,000 words or 70,000 words. Did anybody come up with the name? Andrea Wang. Andrea Wang. It's an incredible picture book. Any last question? Yes. Um, so kind of two questions for you. Um, what, do, what are the future projects that you're working on right now? And do you ever see yourself writing adult fiction? Ooh. By the way, did you hear those questions? What are future projects I'm working on, and do I ever see myself writing adult fiction? Those two questions are, I'm so thankful for them, um, because this is what I want, this is what I would most want to talk about. Um, <laughs> I'm writing a middle grade novel right now, my very first middle grade project, and I'm almost done with it, and it's my favorite thing I've ever done. Um, 
it's about a kid named Manny. Um, and so I, I'm in love with this book and I'm in love with being in the project. Yesterday I was flying from San Diego to here and I was working on it and I just was so happy. So that probably will come out maybe at the very beginning of 25. And then your second question, do I ever see myself writing adult fiction? Absolutely. In fact, um, I am currently making a move to do that. And part of that is a fulfilling contracts that are outstanding. So during the pandemic, I had five contracts I had to fulfill for books that I owed. And now I'm writing the last one. And so I do think I'm going to turn to the adult project that I have been doing along the way. I just haven't ever committed all my time to it. And it's probably around 40,000 words right now, and it'll probably be 80,000, so I'm halfway done. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Should I? OK. So I think we have time for one last question. If anybody wants to ask one last question, it could be about basketball if you want, whatever, you, whatever you're curious. OK, you'll, you'll have the last question. Yes. How do you come up with the names for your characters? Ooh, good question. OK, so this is interesting with this book. Um, tell me if this makes sense to you. So this is the name of the book, Milo Imagines the World. Originally, it was Kimo Imagines the World. And K-I-M-O. I've always liked the name Kimo. Um, but the publisher, they said, it sounds too close to chemotherapy. So could you change it? And I was like, first of all, I was very sad for a few, you know, because I had sat with that for like eight months. But then when I thought about it and I came up with Milo, I thought, wait a second, Milo, maybe this was a happy accident because the M, this is getting very nerdy here, but the M in Milo being further away from the M in Imagines rhythmically works better. So the M in chemo is, you know, the second syllable. So look, chemo imagines the world. It's maybe too close together, but Milo imagines the world. I think that's a better placement of the M. So it was a happy accident, but usually it sounds. Um, my son's name is Miguel, and before I had a son named Miguel, I had used the name Miguel in three different projects. He's the main character in We Were Here, um, and another one of my projects and some short stories. My favorite name in all of my work is Shy, S-H-Y. He's in The Living and The Hunted, but he's also in the adult novel I'm doing. Um, in fact, that's where I got the name first, from the adult project. So I love the name Shy. And I won't say how he got his name because it involves cursing. Um, and I just feel like maybe I shouldn't do that. Um, I love coming up with names. But I was telling some, some people earlier at lunch that I will not allow myself to title a book, though, until it's finished. Because that's like my, it's fun to do that. And I don't think I deserve to be able to do it until I finish the, the hard labor of finishing the book. So yeah, thanks for that question. Thank you all so much for hanging out today. It was such a pleasure.